Good morning. I'm very excited to be here with you. As someone said before, my name is Ivan Garcia. I am from Cuba. And Pastor Carlos, he's a wonderful friend of mine. So let me tell you something. You have a great pastor, and believe me, Carlos has a heart for God. He has a, a heart for his family and for his ministry and for his church. So uh, very early in my life, I understand that God bless when we are faithful to God. But I also learned when I was very young in my life uh, that when you support other people ministry, God also bless you as well because you are supporting those who are extending God's kingdom. So it is good for us just to pray for our pastors, for everybody who are serving God in his kingdom. So love your pastor, love his family. God will bless you as well. And I am here today because, first of all, God's grace. When I was 13 years old, another young man of 14 years old, he shared the gospel with me. He's now a pastor in Cuba as well. And many people invest their time teaching me God's word. Um, showing me what God's plan was for my life. One of those persons was Helen Black. Helen Black was an, an American missionary, and she moved to Cuba when she was very young. And Helen Black, after she invested decades, many years, serving God in Cuba, she died in Cuba. Uh, and I remember, and I have sweet, sweet memories of my time when I was a very young man, <laughs> listening God's word from Helen Black. She thought of... Uh, in her camp, because she was the, the leader of a camp, a youth camp in Cuba. So every year she taught God's word, but she also taught pastors in Cuba and provide training to, le to leaders and pastors. So if I am here today, it's because she invests also her life in my life and in the life of many others. So to me, it is a huge privilege to invest my time today in America, teaching God's word to people who are living in America. Um, and it is, it is a huge privilege to me. So thank you for this opportunity, Pastor Carlos. And I love the name of this church, Grace Bible Church. You know, everything communicates something. And when I listen to the, the name of the church, Grace Bible Church, that communicates to me that you are the most gracious people in this town. So be patient with me. <laughs> If I said something wrong because my Cuban accent, please forgive me. Remember, show grace to me, okay? <laughs> so I invite you to turn your Bibles in Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 20. 20 from verses, from verse 20 through 25. I really like this conversation of Jesus with our people in Luke chapter 20, verses 20 through 25. The Bible says, watching for the opportunity, the leaders, watching for their opportunity, the leaders sent spies pretending to be honest men. They tried to get Jesus to say something that could be reported to the Roman governor so he could arrest Jesus. Teachers, they said, teacher, they said, we know that you speak and teach what is right and are not influenced by what others think. You teach the way of God truthfully. Now tell us, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their trickery and said, show me a Roman coin whose picture and title are a stamp on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well, then he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. I invite you to observe some details in verse 21st. A spies, pretending to be righteous, said to Jesus, teacher, they said, we know that you speak and teach what is right. 
you are not influenced by what others think. In other words, you treat everyone well and treat them as equals. And they also said to Jesus, you teach the way of God truthfully. Then, when Jesus Christ asked, whose image on this coin and inscription is, the people reply, Caesar's. Then he tells them, so give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar's, and give to God what belongs to God. Maybe you are wondering, what was Jesus teaching them? What does it mean to give to God what belongs to God? But we must first understand that the coins had the image of the emperor to visibly indicate that he had dominion over the riches, territories, and even dominated the population conquered by the Roman Empire. If the coin bears the image of Caesar, then it must be given to Caesar's. This is what Christ said to them. And this is one of the spiritual truths contained in Christ's declaration. If we, if you and I, as human beings, have the image of God, then let us give ourselves to God. We have to give to God what belongs to God, our lives, ourselves. Jesus, with this statement, was demonstrating what is the main truth of today's sermon. If you are only going to remember just one sentence or declaration that I am sharing with you today, I would like it to be this. Every human being is made in God's image. I will repeat the main idea of the sermon today. If you are only going to remember just one sentence of everything that I am sharing with you today here, please remember this. Every human being is made in God's image. And this statement is going to change our whole perspective on how we treat people, how we love our people that maybe is different to us. Probably you are asking in your mind, what are the biblical implications of this truth? Well, the Bible reveals three crucial aspects about the doctrine of men, or what we call in theology, anthropology. First of all, the Bible teaches us that we are beautifully made by God. If we read in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, and I am reading in the New Living Translation of the Bible. On Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible says, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image, to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birth in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Verse 27. So God created human beings in his own image. You should underline that phrase. God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. How would you describe yourself if somebody asks you who you are? Maybe you will mention your appearance, your job, your relationships, your nationality. I am from Cuba. No, but I am from the United States. Or maybe you said, I am from Peru or from Spain. Or maybe you will mention your personality. But according to the Bible, what defines you? What defines us? What does, it, what does it mean to be human? What distinguishes us from the animals, for example? What makes us human, especially from a biblical perspective? That's the subject of biblical anthropology, or the study of mankind. mankind. Biblical anthropology is different from scientific, cultural, and social anthropology. Biblical anthropology examines the Bible to answer the question, who we are as human beings. What does the Bible say distinguishes us from animals? How did God create you and me? What is the relationship between our bodies and also our spirits? 
Anthropology asks and tries to answer this question from God's word. Today, we will talk about a fundamental characteristic of humanity, that we all are made in God's image. Remember, this is the main idea today, just to remember, to believe it, to embrace that main idea from the Bible. We all are made in God's image. We are going to talk about what that means and why it matters for us spiritually, but also physically. We talk about this all the time, right? For example, in the context of discussing abortion, for example, when we talk about euthanasia or racism, we insist that we should treat people a certain way because we are made in God's image. And that is true. But what does that really mean, to be made in God's image? And if we are made in God's image, why are we so messed up? And what can we do about that? That's what we are going to talk about today. And here is, we are beautifully made by God. Probably all of us know about Mona Lisa. Why is it just a big deal? Do you think it's a masterpiece or just a painting of some lady? What do you think about it? Well, probably some of you will argue there are better paintings in the world. And I tend to agree with you. Some of you feel it's the greatest artistic masterpiece in history, right? Millions of people agree with you. And they come every year to the museum to see it every year. But here is what we know for sure. Whether or not, in your opinion, it is a masterpiece, you are a great masterpiece. God made you. The real Mona Lisa, whoever she was, is a much greater creation than the, pa that, than the painting. From a Christian and biblical perspective, human beings are God's crowning achievement. His beautiful masterpiece. Because we are made in his likeness. Only people, in contrast to the animals and the trees and everything else, are said to be made in God's image. For example, if you read Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 to 5, the Bible teaches that human beings are the pinnacle of God's created work. Praise God for how he made us. And if we read in Psalm chapter 139, verses 13 and 14, the Bible teaches us that you and me are valuable and worth God's time and energy. But if we read also on James chapter 3, verses 9 through 10, the Bible teaches that because people bear God's image, we speak to them and about them with kindness and love. What does it actually mean to be made in God's image? Well, when we talk about it, we need to think that Everyone has the capacity to relate to God spiritually. We have been made beautifully by God because we have the capacity to relate to God spiritually. Let me tell you, only human beings are created with an immortal spirit. There is no indication in the Bible that animals relate directly to God on a spiritual level. In the creation account, God talks about the animals when he makes them. But he talks to people. He gives his people moral commands that he doesn't give to animals. When Cain killed his brother, he's answerable to God for the crime. When we read Genesis chapter 4, verse 26, we are told that men began to call on the name of the Lord. They worshipped and prayed to God. Before the flood, God says his spirit won't strive with man's spirit forever. There was a relational disconnect between God and man, all because of sin. So we are made to relate to God. We are made to know God. When we read in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus very clearly defined eternal life as 
knowing God and knowing Jesus. So having a relationship with God is something that we are made for. Adam and Eve had a relationship with God in the garden, but it was damaged because of our sin. The scripture really tells the story of how we can return to that type of relationship with God. But also the Bible says that we, human beings, have the capacity to reflect God's character. Only human beings have a moral obligation to do what is right before God. If you read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, the Bible says, But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. And in verse 16, the Bible says, For the scripture says, You must be holy because... I am holy. So we have a sense that it's morally wrong. Only people have a sense that there is some higher morality to which we must adhere. Even if it was a dog, most people should say you don't want to kill it unless it attacks you or your children. So you can just shoot every animal that wanders across your lawn. It is wrong on a moral level. Only human beings even debate about morality or even think about it. That's because only human beings are made to reflect the holy character of God. God never tells a sheep to act more holy. He might declare that the, a sheep is holy. But God, God never places a moral burden or righteousness on a sheep or a goat. Why? Because they don't need salvation because there is no such sin, thing as sin for them or for other animals. But we are beautiful made by God also because we have the capacity to radiate God's glory. This part might surprise you. But we are made physically and spiritually to shine the glory of God in our life. What is God's glory? Maybe you are asking in your mind. Well, this word is from a Hebrew word that refers to God's importance or weightiness. But here is the standing reality. Every time somebody sees God's glory, what they see is a bright and shining light. For example, when we read Exodus 24:17, the appearance of God's glory was like a bright and shining fire. On Exodus 34, 29, whenever Moses spent time in God's presence, he literally shone with the glory of God. Of God. In Matthew 17, verse 2, Jesus shines with the glory of God. They see a shiny and bright Jesus. On Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, the resurrected saints will shine brightly by the brightness of the expanse of heaven like the stars forever and ever. And if we read Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 24, God will make our bodies glorious bodies like Christ. So we are beautifully, beautifully designed to radiate the glory of God. We reflect His holiness and we shine His glory as well. This is true spiritually and also physically. For example, the sun is a light. The sun is a ball on fire and gas. It generates heat. The moon reflects the light of the sun. The moon is still shiny and bright, but it's a reflecting light. Everything that the sun shines upon will reflect its light to some degree or another. We are like the moon or any other object in this respect. We are designed to reflect and radiate out the glory, the greatness of God. As a result, we can rule as God's representative in this world. Just read again Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. That's why the command to exercise dominion over the earth immediately follows the statement that God made us in his image. These are some obvious implications. 
if everyone is beautiful made in God's image, regardless of their capacity or race or sex, then every single person's life is valuable before God's eyes. That means that we cannot take a life, whether the unborn, as in abortion, or the very old, as in euthanasia, human life are not the same as animal lives. In Genesis 9-6, the command against killing other people is root in the image of God. And if we read in James chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, this is why we don't slander or harm people with our words either. This is why as a church, we are against abortion. It is not a political position for us, but it is biblical conviction. It's why we are opposed to euthanasia. It's why we are opposed to treating people differently on the basis of their race or ethnicity as well. Why? Because every single person is equally valuable to God and before God. So everybody deserves to be treated with respect and kindness, even our enemies. Even those who do not look like we do or believe like we do, because we represent God and we represent Jesus and they bear his image. The second reason, and something that we need to take in consideration, is what the Bible teaches about our current condition. Yes, God made us beautifully, but we are badly broken. If we read in Romans chapter 3, verses 23, and Romans chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible says, Romans 3, 23. For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Romans 5, 12. When Adam sinned, sin entering the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death is spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. We are God's greatest masterpiece, but we don't work right. We are broken, and we need to be fixed and only God can do it. But what is sin? Well, sin can take many forms. Basically, everything we think, say, and do that does not please God is sin according to the Bible. If what we think, if what we feel, if what we say or do does not conform to God's character, then it is sin. The Bible even adds that knowing how to do good and not doing it is sin as well. Sin is transgressing God's law. It is missing God's target. It is important to understand that we are all born with a sin nature that develops and manifests our broken nature as we grow. King David clearly understood this when he wrote in Psalm 51, Verse 5, Behold, I have been formed in weakness, and in sin my mother conceived me. So sin has corrupted our entire, entire nature. Some theologians have called this the total depravity of men. Theologian Charles Wright explaining the meaning of this concept of total depravity. The concept of depravity does not mean that each person has exhibited his depravity to the fullest extent of which he is capable. Depravity does not mean that sinners have no conscience or innate induction concerning God. Total depravity does not mean that sinners good incur every form of sin either. And does not mean that the depraved People do not do actions that are good in the sight of others and even in the sight of God. What total depravity means is that corruption extends to every facet of our nation and faculties of men. And it also means that no one has anything that can be considered praiseworthy by a just God. 
So human beings are God's greatest masterpiece. But we don't function well. We are damaged by sin, and we all need to be renewed and restored by God. Maybe you are asking in your mind, is sin genetic or is sin a choice? From a biblical perspective, the answer is both. We have inherited sin, like a disease passed from parent to child, but we also embrace it as well. For example, you might have a family disposition toward heart disease, but also, if you love french fries, like me, so your body has inherited a predisposition toward disease, but it is not entirely the fault of your genetics. If you have a heart attack after a lifetime of eating fries every day, right? Sin is the same way. We have inherited sin from Adam, but you and me, we also choose to sin all the time. So the condemnation we have earned is merited. We deserve separation from God. We are in need of redemption, and we cannot provide it to ourselves. We, can, we cannot think our way to salvation because our mind is sinful as well. We cannot love God on our own because our spirit is sinful. We cannot work our way to God because our body is sinful as well. We were made in God's image, designed to reflect him and to represent him, but that image has been damaged because of sin. We are like a broken mirror where you can see only a broken image. Notice in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that Paul ties sin to failing short of God's glory. God designing us to shine and reflect his glory. But sin has harmed our ability to do that. And finally, there is a good news for you and for me. God can make us new again. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the Bible says that if anybody is in Christ, that person is a new creation. God makes us new again when we trust in Christ as our Savior. And if we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, the Bible says, so all of us who may have that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, make us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. The image has been damaged because of sin, so it needs to be renewed, repaired by the power of the Holy Spirit. That divine process begins when we trust in Jesus Christ. Have you ever power washed your driveway or your house? You get to see something old and nasty seemingly turn new again, all because it's been washed clean. That's the biblical concept. Our sin dirty and messed up the image of God in us. But through the death and resurrection of Christ, we have forgiveness of sins, we have eternal life, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Everything by God's grace. So the Holy Spirit makes us new, washes us clean of sin, and then begins a lifelong process of renewing us into the image of our Creator. So to be renewed, to be the person you were made to be, you must believe in Jesus for forgiveness of sin and for receiving eternal life. I know a man whose name is Alfredo. And Alfredo, with his face downcast with sorrow, meets his father in a cafeteria just for a coffee. He needed to have a conversation with his dad. Visibly damaged by his own sin and life problems, Alfredo confessed his anxieties to his father. He told about work problems, about his concerns regarding the economic inflation, 
he was concerned and very sad about his financial situation because of the high prices of life. But also he mentioned his damaged relationship with his wife, all the demands and claims of his children, his own mistakes, sins, and failures. Everything seemed to be very bad in his life, and he felt that he was worthless. His father then reached into his pocket, pulled out a 100 bill, and asked to Alfredo, Alfredo, do you want this 100 bill? Alfredo, a little confused at first, quickly said, sure, that it is 100 bucks. Who wouldn't want them? Then the father took the bill in his fist and crumpled it up into a small bundle like this one. Showing the crushed green ball, the father asked him again, and now, do you still want it? Alfredo said, Dad, I don't really know what you mean by this, but still it is $100 bill. Of course, I take them if you give it to me. The father unfold the bill, drop it to the floor, and damage more fuel with his shoes. Then pick it up and place it dirty, damaged on the table. Alfredo, do you still want the 100 bill? The father asked. And he replied, look that, I still don't understand what do you mean. And the father said, my son, you must understand that even if sometimes something doesn't turn out the way you want, even if life crushes and tramples you, even if tragedies and problems try to trump you in despair, even if you are damaged by your own sin and mistakes, you are very valuable and precious and important to God. Like every human being, you bear in you God's image and likeness. God loves you and can renew you and cause you to experience a transform a new life. If you still doubt how much you are worth to God, no matter how dirty and messed up life hits you or how much sin has damaged you, I invite you this morning just to look to the cross of Jesus Christ. God loves you. So you must should give Jesus Christ's son out of love for you to give you eternal life, a new life. So Alfredo looked at the 100 bill again, smiled, put it in his wallet, and with renewed hope, returned to his house and continued his life with a clear understanding of his great value before God and what God did for him to change his life. If you doubt your own worth, what you really are, or what God can do in you, remember the main idea of my sermon this morning. Every human being, including you and me, is made in God's image. You are valuable to God. God loves you. And God can make us new again. The value of the human being, due to the image and likeness of God in us, can be measured by the price that Christ paid to bring us closer to God and make us free from eternal punishment. Man has the ability to respond to God's initiative. There are many ways you and me can respond to this message today. This is one way by remaining indolent and rejecting God. But believe me, this will never be a happy or wise way to respond to God's love. And the other way is just by believing in Jesus Christ, the perfect man, man and the perfect God 
who died for us to give us eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your word. Thank you because you made us beautifully. Father, but we are broken. Forgive our sins. We want to honor you. And we want to reflect your glory in everything we do. But not only in everything we do, but we want to reflect your glory in our life. In everything we are. In everything we think. In everything we say. And also in the way that we treat other people. Thank you, Lord, because you have the power to transform and to change our life to your image so we can reflect your glory in a high level. I pray for those in this room that need Jesus in their life. Touch their life. Change their life. We confess our sin before you. Thank you for Jesus Christ who died for us on the cross. Thank you for the hope we have in Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. And help us. Help us to see the people with your eyes and to love people with your love. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.